Well, I, as I said, I started a series uh, la a couple weeks ago, really, and the first message was kind of an introductory message followed by another introductory message. Uh, this is uh, message one of probably seven or eight, and uh, we've, uh, I've titled this, I've titled this Reach, just real simply Reach. And I believe that there's a great need for reaching people with the gospel, with uh, reaching people with what we know we want to share that with other people. And I don't know how many of you have, have ever had a really good thing that you've wanted to keep to yourself. And, and there, I'm not saying that there's not some times that somebody doesn't make a pie or a, or a batch of cookies and maybe you, uh, you take an, an additional plate full of cookies. And uh, I, have, I have never, ever done that. I'm lying to you right now. Uh, I have done that. I have, I have uh, in the past, I don't do that anymore necessarily, but uh, although this is a new day, so you never know. But uh, you take a plate and you put three or four cookies on there, not necessarily to share them with others, but so that you have them for yourself, right? Now, uh, I hope, I hope that you've actually done that for others as well. I hope that maybe you've taken a plate full of cookies or an extra slice of pie and said, this is so good that I just have to share it with other people. And uh, I know that I have done that too. And maybe my wife or my kids or whatever are, are there, and I, I'll try to demonstrate that uh, this, this afternoon when I walk past all the pies and you see three pieces of pie and you say, Pastor, that's gluttonous. And I say, well, actually, it's for other people. It's just so good. How can I not share it with other people, right? And uh, when I think about reaching people with the gospel, I think about sharing with others what, what, what is good for us right? We want to share that with other people. So last week, I did something that's kind of unconventional, and, uh, and I gave you the outline for the next seven, eight weeks. And I kind of broke it down into three parts. Number one, as we talk about reaching people with the gospel, we talked about the man, the, the, the individual that actually goes out and reaches people. We talked about the man. Then we talked a little bit about his mission. What is the mission of the man? And then we talked about the method, just touched on it as an outline. I said there is the man, there's the mission, and then there's the method. What is the method by which the man carries out the mission, right? So, so that's kind of the, the broad overview. Now, underneath the topic of the man, which we're going to be talking about this morning, I mentioned basically there's three parts. It has something to do with having a clear head, having a caring heart, and having clean hands. So the person as a whole has to have a clear head. They have to have a caring heart, and they have to have clean hands. So this morning, we're going to talk about having a clear head. How do we have a clear head? As we go out and we, we uh, promulgate the gospel message, as we teach other people what has been taught to us, we have to have a clear head. So by way of introduction, we need to talk a little bit about perspective. I believe that most of what we see is determined by where we see it from. We have to have the right perspective on a, on a matter. And whether we like it or not, perspective is everything. Uh, several weeks ago, when Brooks was in town, he took this picture of Ben. And Ben is uh, standing here, and it looks as if Joel and, uh, and Josh are in Ben's hand, and he is ready to flick them, like any, like any good big brother ought to be doing. He's, uh, he's ready to, to flick them out of his hand. And you see that uh, Joel primarily is scared to death, hiding behind Josh. And it looks like Josh has guns up like this, right? Now, if you were to see this from where we were standing inside the church, you would realize that, that Joel and Josh are actually a great distance away. You see, what we see, the perspective by which we see things, is determined by where we stand. Perspective is, is important. And now when we talk about reaching people with the gospel, it's no different. When we talk about reaching people who are lost, if our perspective is wrong, if we don't see that there is a community out there, that there's a world out there that needs to be reached, then guess what's going to happen? We're not going to reach them. We're not going to go reach somebody if they don't need to be reached. So you can see that 
Perspective is important. Are these people really lost? And do they need help? Now, the reason the squeaky wheel gets the grease is because the squeaky wheel is causing us to realize its need. And if the wheel did not squeak, we wouldn't think of it any differently than the ones that don't squeak. So we need to see things for what they are. And I've given you three perspectives here this morning on how we can have a clear head. Three perspective, perspectives on how to have a clear head. And I'm just going to blast through these things. First of all, perspective one. Perspective one, life is short and death is certain. And if we don't have a clear perspective on this, we'll never think that there is an urgency to get out there and help others. Life is short and death is certain. Uh, what we believe will determine the way we behave. What we believe will determine the way we behave. And I think Job had it right in Job 14, 1 and 5, when he said this, Man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. Now, boy, you could stop right there and just say, boy, he nailed that one, didn't he? He goes on to say, He cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. Now, that's an interesting example. He, he, he cometh forth like a flower, quickly. And it's quick, and then it's cut down, and there's nothing left. And he fleeth also as a shadow. And if I stand here and cast a shadow on the wall behind me, and when the object moves, the shadow's gone. Verse 3. And, and dost thou... Open thine eyes upon such an one, and bringest me into judgment with thee? Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Not one. Ready? Verse 5. Seeing his days are determined. See, Job knew this. Seeing his days are determined. The number of his months are with thee. Thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. So you have, uh, you have been set a certain box, a certain perimeter, some bounds that you cannot get beyond. And there are a lot of people who live their life as if they're going to live on this earth forever. They don't think life is short, and they certainly don't think that death is certain. But Job had it right. Job had it right. The days of, of man are few in verse 1. They're frail in verse 2, and they're fixed in verse 6. So man's days are few, frail, and fixed. We have limitations, don't we? And if you don't have the right perspective, you're not going to reach other people. Why would there be a need to reach somebody if you think you're going to live forever? Because you think they're going to live forever on this earth. There's no need to reach them. Why would you want to share with them good news? Because there's always tomorrow. There's always a, another chance to go reach them with the gospel. But if you knew, if you knew absolutely for sure that one day you will die, and it could be tomorrow, and any one of us could die today, it will change how we behave because it's all about perspective. The psalmist knew that in Psalm 39, 4, when he said, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days. What is it? He goes on to say that I may know how frail I am. The psalmist says, Lord, I want to know when my end is going to be. I want to know when that's going to happen. I want to know when I'm going to die because I want to remember how frail I am. And can I tell you this morning that there's a lot of people who don't, who don't think of their life as being frail. Hey, just go twist an ankle and you'll realize how frail your life is. Uh, several, a couple years ago, I was, I, was in the, I was in the cafe area when it was my office. And I climbed up on a chair, like any good contractor would do, to change a light bulb. Probably one of the most simple things to do, right? Y'all can change a light bulb. And I stepped on this chair, and it was one of those kind of uh, bar stool chairs, so it's up higher. And I did something that every contractor would do. I stepped from one object to the next object, and I just wanted to lean on the desk a little bit. And I tell you what, that chair came out from underneath me, 
And I landed with my rib cage right on top of that metal bar. That did not give at all. But I tell you what, I laid on that ground in there, and Rebecca and Dana and the boys, they came in, and I think Dana was fanning me, and I was on the brink of passing out. And at that moment, I'm laying there going, dear God, help me. I'm frail. I'm going to die. And I asked Dana, I said, what does blood taste like in your mouth? I said, I think I'm dying. I had a bruise from there to there. I didn't break any rib. I'm sure it damaged something internally. It was horrible. My life is frail. Your life is frail. And if you don't realize that, your perspective is wrong. Your perspective is wrong. And I think he wanted to know, I think the psalmist wanted to know how frail his life was. In a similar way, the psalmist wanted to number his days for perspective of gaining wisdom. He wanted right perspective. In Psalm, uh, Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days. Really, count your days. Why? He says, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Not that we may work a little extra and gain a little more, but that I want to be wise. I want to know you, Lord, and the power of the resurrection. I want to know my Savior. Not that he can have more of the world, but that he can have more of God. He wanted to be wise. And so many people are just living life, not for wisdom, but the psalmist wanted to know he wanted to number his days that he could apply himself to wisdom. Not to work, but to wisdom. James 4.14 is a really common verse. And it talks about how quick life goes. It says this in verse 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. So you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. Now, we try to plan our days. I think it's good. I think it's good. I think we ought to plan our days. But, but here he's saying... Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't really, don't really know. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. What a powerful verse. I know somebody who had this as a, uh, a picture on their, on their wall in the doctor's office. I knew a doctor had had this. And he said, I never want to forget how, f- how, how quick life goes. Just boom, just like that. And I know my, my kids, I think Josh says, he says, why is it the older you get, the faster life goes? <laughs> I said, just hold on to your seat, son. It's just, poof, gone. Life is a vapor which appears for a little time. It's a little vapor. How many of y'all feel like that, that are old anyway? Amen. Even some young people, yeah. I tell you what, just gone. And that's our life. Now listen, this is just a quick application, but hear me out. Reaching people with the gospel begins by having a clear head and a right perspective that life is short and death is certain. If we miss that perspective, we'll never reach people with the gospel. Secondly, secondly, heaven and hell are real. Perspective two, heaven and hell are real. If we do not believe what we preach to others, we'll never reach others with the gospel. If God's word has not affected us personally, if God's word has not affected us, we'll never influence others. Because we haven't really changed. Because we have a wrong perspective. It must affect us. And this is why I think the rich man, as we read last week in Luke 16, this is why the rich man wanted to reach his five brethren. It says in Luke 16, 27, 28, it says, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, talking to Abraham, that thou, that thou wouldest send him, talking about Lazarus, to my father's house. Listen to this. For I have five brethren that, have, that, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. You see, there was this rich man, and there was this, this beggar, Lazarus, and, and, and when in hell, he lifted up his eyes and says, go send somebody to tell my brethren that this thing is real. My whole life, the rich man maybe have thought, well, it's just what we talk about, but it's not real. 
And here he's saying this is a real deal. Heaven and hell are real. And we need to be moved by that. I mean, the rich man was convinced. He was convinced. And one day we'll stand before the Lord. And there's a lot of atheists out there. There's a lot of agnostics out there. There's a lot of people that say, you know what? We're not going to really stand before God. There's not really a place of, of eternal uh, treasure and, and, and goodness and, and, and in eternity where there is our Lord. And there's certainly not the opposite. There's certainly not a hell. So they're not convinced. So if we have the, a wrong perspective, if our perspective is, is that this thing is just fake anyway, that this isn't real, this is, this is just a, a figment of our imagination. But in reality, men of God were moved by the Holy Ghost. That's why this thing came about. They were moved by the Holy Ghost because the Holy Ghost is real. Because God's real. And this book is real. And what it contains is real. And if our perspective is wrong, where we can't trust it, where we don't really believe that heaven and hell are real, then we're not going to go out there and win the lost, are we? In Romans 14, 10 to 12 says, For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Every person is going to stand before the Lord sooner or later. And if our perspective is wrong, we'll never go reach people with the gospel. Friends, perspective is everything. Life is short, death is certain, and heaven and hell are real. And there tends to be a, 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 a movement a movement away from talking about hell. Now, I get it. It's not the best thing to talk about in terms of uh, positive stuff. But there have been a lot of people who tend to move away from talking about the consequences of our unbelief. You would agree there are consequences, for, there are consequences in life. Most people, and I would say a lot of televangelists, a lot of megachurch pastors, they tend, to, they tend to shift towards more like the power of positive thinking, and let's just think on the good things of heaven. Well, I'm not saying not to think about them, but I'm telling you, if we don't believe hell is real, then what are we concerned with anyway? If hell isn't real, then let's just live it up a little bit. I'm not concerned about other people. Why would I be concerned about other people? The worst thing that happens is they don't go to hell. No, friends, the worst thing that happens is they do go to hell. And so we have to know and believe that this is true. Reaching people with the gospel begins by having a clear head and having a right perspective that heaven and hell are real. It's not real. What are we doing here? I mean, really? Why did you dedicate two hours with Sunday school? I'm not saying I'm preaching for two hours. Why did, you, why did you come here to spend time in Sunday school to learn about God if it's not real? And if it's not real, then he lied, and he's not God. Then what are we here for? Either we believe it or we don't. Third, thirdly, the perspective three. The lost must be found. The lost must be found. A right perspective here begins by believing that what is lost is, in fact, important. What is lost is important. And if you've lost something that you've cared about, you will look for it. And if you've lost something that you do not care about, you won't look for it. The other day, the kids mowed, and, and they, they did this one job, made 25 bucks, came home, and uh, they, um, I can't remember what, it, what had happened, but it was, it, the money was lost. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, Where, where's, you know, you want to put away the money, the $25, and we want to make sure that we see it, because it has value. And uh, so the boys, they looked around trying to find it. Well, why would they look for it? Because it has value. And so this perspective, the lost must be found, begins by knowing that what's lost is important. 
Now, they could have decided not to look for it, right? They could have decided that. They could have said, you know what, Dan? We've got so much that $25, the, the effort to look for $25 is just, I, I can't afford to look for $25. And, and they could have said that because they did have a, a huge stack of cash. When I like that, I mean that. Huge stack of cash. And they could have said, what's $25 in the grand scheme of things anyway? And I could see, I could see a, a church with a lot of people I could see a church with a lot of people not valuing other people as much because they have so many other people. Now, I could see the same thing from a small church who might say, you know what, the more people we have, the more problems we have. So why add to the problem? Let's just forget that, you know. Who, we, don't, we don't need more problems, you know. So you could have that perspective too. But we must take to account that what is lost is important. And it's important to find the lost even if you have plenty. Luke 15, 4-9 talks about a, a shepherd who had a hundred sheep and, uh, and lost one of the sheep. And the desperation to leave the 90 and 9 and go out and seek the one that's lost. Do you know why? Because he was important. Listen to this. Beginning in verse 4. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he is found? Isn't that interesting? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. I can just imagine a shepherd who's got this, uh, got this uh, sheep on his shoulder and and, uh, and he's got, he's got, he leaves the 90 and 9, and, and, and as a shepherd communicates with his sheep, he probably says something like this, stay there, you know, so, so he's saying, stay there. And then he finds the one sheep, and he puts him on the shoulders, and he says, come with me. And he's going, and he's rejoicing because he lost something that was important to him that he did not go find. He's rejoicing because he found something that was lost, that was important to him. So he went out there, and he throws this sheep on his shoulders, and he rejoices. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I can just see the desire and the excitement because the sheep was important. He says in verse 7, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. And then they kind of give a, another example, another wonderful illustration here. Either, either what woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently until she find it. Here's a lady who had 10 pieces of silver. Well, I just one. I lost just one. I got nine others. The shepherd could have said, I got 99 other sheep. But he didn't. Neither did she. She swept the house and, and sought diligently till she found it. Verse 9, and when she hath found it. She calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. What a wonderful testimony of what's important in life. There is more rejoicing over finding the lost than tending to the living. It's, 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 there's more rejoicing over one sinner that repenteth than 99 just persons which need no repentance. This doesn't diminish the need to tending to the ones we already have found in the past. It just emphasizes that we need to go out and find more people in the future. That's what this is about. This was the purpose of Jesus coming to earth. Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. To seek and to save that which is lost. Why? Here's why. 
because it's important. One soul is valuable. Reaching the lost with the gospel, the good news. Never forget that one day someone led you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Never, re- never forget that day. Never forget the day that you came to know the Lord as your Savior, where you said, you know what, I know where I'm going when I die. Interesting, I, I got a call from Alondo, a friend of mine. I led him to the Lord maybe three, four years ago at this time. And uh, I, w- I, was telling, uh, I was telling Max, and he called me the other day, and he's crying. And he's crying. I'm just like, whoa, 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 Rolando, what's going on, buddy? Calm down, calm down. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I said, calm down. What's going on? And finally, he got his composure, and he says in tears on the phone, he says, my brother has got six months to live. I just found out. And he's crying. And he said to me, I just want to be certain where he's going when he dies. And he's saying this in tears. I'm getting, I'm getting teary thinking about it. He was so concerned He wanted his brother to know where he was going to. You know, probably a year and a half ago, Rolando comes in the door, and he's got uh, two sisters and a brother. And again, my office was in the the, uh, coffee area. And he says to me, he comes in, and he closes the door, and he says, "This this is part of my family. He says, I want them to know. And so it was really cool. I was able to lead uh, one of his sisters and his brother to the Lord. This is a different brother. One brother and one sister. S- sister never, the other sister, you know, she, I don't think she got saved. But now he's calling me a year and a half later saying, I have a brother who's dying. I want him to know. I said, listen, I will come out there. Where are you at? He says, he says I'm in Iowa City. I said, can, can you talk to your brother and see if Tuesday morning will work? I mean, I'll come out there now, but, we'll, but I'll come out Tuesday morning. I'll spend all morning with him. And he's crying. He's like, yes, Pastor, please. It's that important to him. It's that important to him that his brother knows what he knows. I tell you, we have to have the right perspective. If we have the wrong perspective, we're going to do the wrong things. If we have the wrong perspective on life and we think, well, there'll always be another day then our lives are are filled with, with, in a sense, meaningless. And we end up laying up treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves do break in and steal. We tend to live for now and not for eternity. But one of the greatest privileges that we have is knowing perspective, knowing that one day when we die, we will be with our Lord. And that's exciting to me. That's why we're here this morning. That's why I'm behind the pulpit this morning. It's to to convince and to exhort the gainsayer. It's to compel you to believe something different about eternity. It's to compel you to live differently right now. Now, friends, if you're here today and you don't know where you're going when you die, If you come into this place and say, you know what, Pastor Joe, I'm just not certain that when I die, I'm going to be spending an eternity with the Lord. I know many of you get tired of this illustration. Never get tired of the gospel. Because there's a lot of churches that don't tell people how to go to heaven. And then there's a lot of churches that tell people how to go to heaven by their own good works, which doesn't tell someone how to get to heaven. I want this hand right here to represent you and me. I want this wallet to represent all of our sin. The Bible says that we all have sin. The Bible says that there is a payment for this sin. There is a wage for this sin. In 1 John chapter 2, For he is the propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. That just simply means that he didn't die just for you, but he died for everyone in this room and everybody in this world. Jesus Christ came to this earth to die on the cross for your sin. Now you say, well, why did he have to die? 
Because the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. The payment for the sin is death. It doesn't say that the wages of sin is church membership or the wages of sin is coming to church or the wages of sin is turning over a new leaf or, 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 or getting baptized. Three baptisms this morning, maybe one next week, hopefully. But that does not save them. The wages of sin is not, is not water baptism. The wages of sin is death. Someone has to die for the sin. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, I want this hand to represent Christ, he came to this earth to, and he died. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to this earth to die on the cross because the wages of sin is death. And what happens is he transfers that sin to him. And this happens by faith. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through water baptism. No, it doesn't. For by grace you're saved through church membership? Nope. For by grace you're saved through uh, raising your hand, coming to church, becoming a member, walking an aisle, praying a prayer, walking little old ladies across the street, tithing, giving money to the church? No, no, no. For by grace you're saved through faith. And it goes a little further and it says, and that not of yourselves. It's not, a, it, it, it's not of works. It's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Why? lest any man should boast, because there will be no braggers in heaven that say, I got here because I got water baptized. I got here because I was a member of Northside Baptist Church. I, I got here because I put money in that plate every, every single Sunday, Lord. I, I put money there, and I'm going to heaven because I stacked bills in that plate. There'll be no braggers in heaven. It's nothing that you can do. It's only what you believe. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. I'm so thankful for that. I couldn't make it on my own. I, I, would, have a, I would have a church of performers if I just said, hey, listen, all we got to do is be good people. But you know what you're doing? That's a death sentence for you in terms of your eternity because it's to him that worketh not. But believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. You see, it's not what you do, it's what Jesus has done for you. I'm so thankful for that. If you're here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior, if you don't know where you're going when you die, maybe, maybe you have been trusting in your good works. Maybe you've been trusting in your church attendance. Maybe you've been trusting in water baptism or walking an aisle or praying a prayer. And maybe you have not been trusting that Jesus is the Savior who saves you from your sin. And maybe today is the first time you've done that. Maybe today is the first time that you realize that Jesus paid it all. It's all to him I owe. He paid it all. And if he paid all of it, how much do you have to pay for? Nothing. You can't pay for your sin because Jesus paid for it for you. I pray that nobody leaves this place without trusting Christ as your Savior. We have to change our perspective if we want to reach the lost. We have to have a clear head. Life is short. Death is certain. Heaven and hell are real. And friends, can I tell you this morning that the lost must be found? 